It's time to take a step beyond. The podcast to inspire creativity and imagination. Here's your host, Dr. Anthony Poston. Thanks for tuning in to A Step Beyond. Okay, so I'm a huge movie fan. It's where I like to go disengage from real life for a couple of hours and let myself get totally absorbed into a story. For some people, they read books, fiction. I like movies. Plus, watching a movie is faster. But we take a lot for granted in movies, mostly the detail. And I believe that the detail is often where the key to good storytelling lies. If you ever watch a movie closely... Someone is spending a lot of time to make sure the characters look real, whether it's a cut or a burn from an explosion or a full-fledged alien or monster. That someone is with us today. Our guest is an Oscar and Emmy Award-winning makeup and visual effects artist. He's been doing this for about 30 years and is the co-founder of K&B EFX Group, one of the most prolific special makeup effects studios in Hollywood, with a resume that includes over 800 feature films, and television credits. Recent movies and television shows include The Hateful Eight, Deepwater Horizon, Lone Survivor, Breaking Bad, and The Walking Dead. Ladies and gentlemen, the very talented and super stylish, and I'm referring to his awesome beard, Howard Berger. (laughs) Howard, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thanks, man. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I appreciate it. So you're a storyteller, but in a different kind of way. You tell a story within a story in the details. And, of course, you have to work with a lot of different people, including writers, directors, producers, etc. So how how do you begin the process and get your arms around it so you know how to start designing what these characters will look like when they're done? Well, it usually starts, we'll we'll get a script. The production will send us a script and we'll read it and kind of like, you know, kind of see what's in there, kind of feel what the movie's about and and what they're thinking about. And then we'll, we'll have a couple ideas or, you know, a handful of ideas, and then we'll go to the table and um, and meet with the director and producers and kind of say, okay, well, this is what we're thinking. Tell me what you're thinking, and then we'll hear what they want, and uh, we'll take some of their ideas and go back and we then start doing a lot of artwork. And um, we have a really good design team. This guy John Wheaton and Mike Broom and Dave Grasso, and they'll do a bunch of Photoshop art, and we'll do a, like a week's worth of stuff, and we could produce probably like 30 versions in, in about a week. And then we'll submit them to the director, and see what he thinks, and get notes, and read, read, uh, design, and go on and on. And then that's kind of how we come up with stuff. You know, that seems to be a really good way. And and we use Photoshop because it we can create a cinematic sense. You know, put the piece into a scene, and that way they kind of can look at it and go, okay, yeah, that's how it's going to be when we get to set. You know, um, and that's kind of that's great for us because then it's approved, and we then have move on to the next step, which is our sculptors and mold makers and fabricators and all that crazy stuff but that's really how it all begins you know because we want to obviously put our two cents in but we it's very important for us to know what the director's vision is and the producers and and um you know we have to look at the time frame and the financial constraints but for the most part we're always we always find a way to deliver you know something super super cool yeah, you know, that sounds like a ton of work, though. I mean, it is e- even before you start, even before you get going with it. I mean, because of course, when people think of Hollywood, they think of shooting movies. They always think of the sets. They think of you know getting it all ready and then you know, you know action and cut, and th- right. they don't realize how much time goes into it. You know, before that. Oh yeah, it's huge, and but sometimes it's there's not enough time, and that's the problem because you've got you have different. Um, you know, facets, different departments that are make everything, like the costume department has to design and make things, and the set department designs and makes things, and makeup, and, you know, uh, things like that, and, and uh, set dressing, and it, it can be, it's a huge task, you know, it's sometimes in the good old days, we would have like six months pre-production, now it's like, we're lucky if we get three, you know, two to three months, you know, to, to prep something, so, um and again, you know, depending on what a show is, because every movie and TV show is different, you know, it has different needs. So, like, what what was needed for Hateful Eight is very different than what's needed for, you know, like Breaking Bad. Um, so you kind of have to weigh those options and take a look at things. When you're doing a movie, you build per the shooting schedule. So once the uh, assistant director puts out a schedule, like this is how the order we're going to shoot it in, these are the scenes, you take a look at it, and then you start to build per that instead of like, oh, well, we should start building this, this, and this, even though it's shooting at the end of the show. You don't want to do that because then you're going to start, you know, um, 
creating a domino effect with the stuff that's up first. So you have to be great at budgeting. You have to be great at scheduling. You have to be able to communicate with people all different types because every single person is different. You know, your directors are this way, producers are this way. Then you have actors to contend with as well. So, you know, it's it's really a huge um, undertaking, and it's it's – it's, it can be very – the pre-production period is, I find, always very fun, but it's also very, very labor-intensive and, and exhausting. Um, but so is on set. That's extremely labor-intensive and exhausting, but in a different way. Um, but, yeah, it takes a lot. It's a big machine to, to get everything going, and you try to work as a team with everybody because you want it all to be one – vision, you know, and, and make it feel like you, you know, you're part of the director's universe. Um, I've certainly worked on films and seen movies where I'm like, that doesn't feel like, this is so different than this, and this doesn't go together, and it's like everybody was making their own movie, and that, unfortunately, to me, is a fail. Um, so we all try to work very closely together. I work very closely with the costume department and, and the art department and um, and, the, and even the, the camera department, the, the cinematographer, you know, so I can understand what his lighting situations are going to be, what colors he's thinking about using, because that all impacts all of us, you know, on the creative end. You know, you mentioned uh, contending that you have to contend with the actors. So, give yeah. me an example of what that means. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, if we're I'm a makeup artist, so that means I have to work. I have to apply makeup to the actor. So, uh, what we try to do is in the trailer. We have a big makeup trailer that we'll use on you know different trailers on every show, but I try to make it as comfortable, familiar, and accommodating as possible so that the actors want to come and sit and be patient and let us do our job. You know, there's some trailers I've worked in where I was in the um, department head, and department head means that I run the entire show, like as far as makeup and hair and all that stuff goes, and be it straight makeup or beauty makeup or, or prosthetic makeup, that falls all under my umbrella. <clears throat> and um, I've been in shows where I'm not the department head, and it's it just becomes a disaster. So I made it a plan early on and a commitment early on that I was always going to make it really nice in the trailer. It's, it's quiet. It's calm. There's no drama. There's always really great coffee. We have an espresso maker in there. I always bring with me. There's, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, after, after lunch, uh, drink, if you want one, uh, you know, be it alcoholic or coffee or what have you. And, um, I just want people to come in, you know, and I always hire people, uh, to work with me on my team that are really great people. So when I get actors that come in, they, you know, they're going to, some actors will be in there for 10 minutes. Some actors might be in there for three hours. So, um, you know, we're always the people they see first and they come to get cleaned up at the end of the night. So we're the first people they see and the last people they see. And I want them to always want to come in and feel like they're part of a family and that they don't feel weird. And we're just like, all right, get in the chair. Let's get out. And same with extras. Like whenever I have my background actors, I really make it a point that my crew, myself and my crew, really make it inviting for them. I don't I don't like it when they're treated differently. Nobody should be treated any differently than anyone else. And um, I make nameplates for every makeup artist, and they're above their station. So when somebody new sits in their chair, they know who their who their makeup artist is. And I always ask them to make sure they introduce them. Hi, my name is Howard. What's your name? You know, and then and you get to know them. So like when I did this TV show, The Orville, which is the Seth MacFarlane show that's running on Fox now at uh, at 9 a.m. on Thursday or 9 p.m. on Thursdays. Um, we had a lot of people coming through the trailers all the time because we had tons and tons of aliens and extras and cast and so forth. And um, I ended up through the course of it building a really great cachet of my background actors. So I always pulled them in. I'd always like go to production. I want these guys, you know, these 10 guys in today. Um, and we just became, they became part of the family and it makes them feel good too. And then they do a better job on set opposed to feeling like a piece of meat that's just like stand there, walk there. They're part of the whole machine. And I think it's really, really important. I've always made that a point on every single show I ever work on is that we all, we know everybody's name and everybody knows us. And, and it's, it's, no one is treated with disrespect because of whatever pecking order is supposed to be in the, in the film industry. I don't, I don't abide to that. I, everyone to me is on the same plane. So, uh, and they're treated that way. And I think it works really, really well. Well, you know, with over 800 film and movie credits to, and, and TV credits to your, uh, your name, I'm sure you've had a variety of personalities to work with. And I won't have you give, give me any examples per se, but I'm sure you've had some really, really good ones and some divas that are challenges. And you know, I, I well, I, I've, I've, I have. Luckily, I've said I'm going to say like 99 percent have been fantastic, and maybe one percent has not been fantastic. So I always have really good experiences with talent. Um, I've have maybe three 
actors that I would never want to work with again, and it was because they were disrespectful and rude and and um, to everybody. And and I really felt like they did, weren't there to do – they didn't do their job. Their job is to show up, and part of the day is to do their makeup and do their costume and know their lines. And, and I felt that they they were not uh, – they weren't ready to do that. And to me, that's, that's disrespectful to the entire crew and, and film company that's there doing their job and working hard. So – so yeah, my experience has been really great. I've been very lucky, like working with people like you know Anthony Hopkins and James McAvoy and um, and uh, Jamie Foxx and Seth MacFarlane. Um, some really really outstanding uh, artists or um, uh, actors and, and individuals, you know. And uh, so yeah, I, I always I get asked this question a lot, but the the, the bad uh, are are very very minimal and. Uh, I've just been I've been very blessed that I get to work with really outstanding people. Well, I know you've worked with uh, Mark Wahlberg a lot, and yeah, actually, and Mark, of course. Yeah, and actually, yeah. Mark's been Mark's Mark's kind of a uh, a person of interest here in in Iowa now because he's he's here all the time because he has a partnership with a huge grocery store chain here in here here in Des Moines and oh really uh, oh yeah so he's here in town quite often these days. Okay, so you mentioned Seth MacFarlane's Orville. I, I love the Orville. It's one of my favorite shows on television. <laughs> You and, and for a lot of reasons, but you know, I, I've, I'm a big Star Trek fan. I always have been. Uh-huh. And when I and when I I've always watched Star Trek, I always thought, okay, I'm a former military guy. These guys are a little too polite. All right, so um, that's why I like the Orville because it's so it's 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 more true to form of how people would actually probably talk oh, and think. Oh, cool. Right, right, yeah. So you you've created all the aliens for that show, and you know it, it's hard for me personally to pick a favorite because uh, you know. I, I am amazed at how many you've had to design and create. I mean, I mean, one episode alone, you could, you, you had to do a ton of krill, um, just because they were everywhere. Uh, yeah. And speaking of that episode, I have to ask, you know, um, Isaac the robot who came out, you know, was all covered in Mr. Potato Head parts. Did you guys have to create yeah. those parts too? Yeah. Well, we well yeah we did we co-designed Isaac with. Uh, uh, the costume department, the designer's name is Joseph Poro, and he did Isaac's body, and we did hands and head and all that stuff, and that was a pretty pretty monstrous task, actually. It seems it seems simple, but it was really difficult. Um, and then, yeah, we took it on ourselves to do the oversized Mr. Potato Head pieces, and the thing was we had to, one, get the rights from Hasbro, and, and we weren't allowed to change anything about them except the size. So we went ahead and we built those pieces in ZBrush, and then we output them. Uh, we have a we have a um, uh, a digital printer or a uh, you know a 3D printer rather, and then we printed them and cleaned them up and painted them and put like little magnets in them and I attached them to Isaac's helmet. And Mark Jackson plays Isaac. He, he voices him and also is inside the suit. And um, and yeah, so that was that was one of our our things. I think one of the interesting things I learned about TV and 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 on the Orville is, you know, I felt we did film work quality, and there was so much of it. And but for me, it's like some of that stuff was like, okay, this could just star in a movie, but it would be like, okay, it's just going to shoot for an hour. All right, great. What's next? And I'm like, but this thing is like amazing. <laughs> so it, it was hard for me to move past like, wow, it only works this one day and we've put so much time and effort into it. But that's the nature of the beast. And I think that's what's kind of fun about Orville and the opportunities that Seth MacFarlane and his, and his team had given us is, you know, coming up with making some of the coolest stuff uh, for a TV show. And, um, but yet it's, it's, there's tons of it and it's going to fly. You know, it's like this guy is not going to play in every episode. This guy's going to play in this one scene. I'm like, wow, okay, well, maybe he'll come back and stuff and say, yeah, maybe. <laughs> like, okay, well, let's try to get him back. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I got to tell you. Maybe throw him into season two or something. When so, Isaac came out as Mr. Potato Head, I, I, I I literally laughed out loud. I mean, I, yeah, it was a good gag. Yeah, that, that was that was a funny gag, and, and of course, the follow up gag was even funnier in, in a different yeah. way. So, um, and, and, and I talked to Carrie the other day, Byron, and she told me that she had finagled her way on to uh, as uh-huh. an, as an extra alien yeah, on was, the show. Yeah, I had her and Tori uh, come, and I called them. I said, "Guys, want to come be aliens? You know, on Monday?" And they're like, "Sure, that sounds great." So they showed up, and I think they had no clue what what was the plan was. You know, so. I put them in the main trailer, so I did Tori, and then Garrett Emmel did um, did Carrie, and uh, we made them up as these characters called Calavan, which are in the uh, episode two, the zoo episode, mm-hmm. and uh, and they got featured in everything. And the thing is, I didn't tell anybody that you know the MythBuster guys are here. So, but after I cleaned them up, 
spot in the center. Everyone's like, oh, my God, the Mythbusters are. I said, they've been here all day. They've just been Calavon all day, you know, and, and everyone was all flipped out. Like, oh, my God, I love them. They're so great. But uh, it was super, super fun, and I'm, I'm hoping, uh, you know, I can get them to come visit on season two, and, and uh, we'll do we'll make them up as some other character, which will be great. So, But they, they were super fun. It was a great, it was really a blast having them here, being being guest aliens. Sounds like I need to find a way to finagle myself on as a guest alien. Yeah, I'll just just show up and then we'll uh, we'll plan it and make it out make it happen. So that sounds like I'm, I, I'm I'm the king of picking who's going to be who, so that works out well. Well, it's nice to know the <laughs> king, dilly dilly. All right, yep, so there you go. so okay, talk a bit about how you got into this field. Um, you've always known you wanted to do this, right? Yeah, I I love movies and I love monsters and and I have all my life. And when I was about eight years old, I you know talking to my dad and and I said. There's you know, there's people that make these, right? And he's like, yeah, they're makeup people. And so I started to try to figure out. I mean, back then there was no way to really figure out except from one magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland. And my parents bought me that. And, and I was just like, that was my holy Bible. And there were photos of like John Chambers and, you know, all these other, maybe John, Dan Streepak doing all these makeups for like Planet of the Apes and Island of Dr. Moreau and all this other super cool stuff that I really, really loved. And, and, um, and then I just started playing around with clay and, kind of had a basic idea how it all works and I just kind of started to do it on my own and that's really the thing and making masks was the the first step for me because there I had to like sculpt and mold and run and seam and patch and paint and hair and make teeth and make eyes and that way I could really take it down the road and see how it um you know see how it all develops and and it was great I, I always tell people that are just starting off like you guys should start making masks because that'll tell you everything you know and that'll teach you everything but that's how it kind of started so I just kept doing it and doing it and getting better and better and you know I was lucky enough to meet my two of my idols or when I was young uh, Stan Winston and Rick Baker and uh, they were always really great and supportive and and gave great you know critiques and uh, and when I graduated high school um, at 18, I got a job working for Stan Winston, and I worked on I, two movies back to back, Alien and um, Aliens, rather, and uh, Invaders from Mars. And then I stayed on for Predator and Pumpkinhead, and um, and then I went over to Rick Baker's and worked on Harry and the Hendersons. And at a certain point, uh, I was working for a, a really good guy named Kevin Yeager, and I was running his shop. I was there for two years, and I had worked on Child's Play, and then um, I was we're finishing up Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, and he had hired me to do Freddy's makeup on Robert England. And at that point, I decided I wanted to kind of branch out and do my own thing. So two of my best friends, Greg Nicotero and, and Robert Kurtzman, um, we decided to, to stop working for other people and start our own company, and we did with very little money and had like a teeny little 800-square-foot shop in Canoga Park and, and got a couple of jobs doing it for almost free, and then word spread, and we just kept getting busier and busier, and our reputation picked up, and um, you know it worked out really well because the three of us were very had different talents, you know, and could do different things, and and uh, but we all worked towards the same common goal, you know, and uh, it was great, you know, K and, that's how K and B started off, and then something like 15 years later, uh, Bob Kurtzman left the company and. He moved back to Ohio, and then it was just Greg and I, and then things changed. The relationship changed, and the company changed, and, and we started to do other things and get bigger and bigger, and that's where Greg ended up landing um, The Walking Dead, and that's really his baby. You know, he's he really is the guy behind um, all that stuff on The Walking Dead, and um, and now he's a, uh, the main director. He does, like, five to seven episodes a, a season, and he's an executive producer, and um, you know, I'm really super proud of him because he's he's really moved up the ladder quite quickly, and and he works super hard, and he busts his, busts his hump every every single day. It's nonstop. Those shows are nonstop. So, but he uh, he's really like I just always call him the king of the zombies. I don't know if it annoys him or not. He might like it because he's from Pittsburgh and the George Romero world and Tom Savini world. And but um, but yeah, no, I think it's cool, man, and I think that's also why K and B has worked for years because. You know, Greg and I both love monsters in movies, but we like different monsters in movies. Like, I love the character makeups and fantasy stuff, and Greg is, loves, like, the zombie stuff and the horror stuff. And, and you know, um, and I think that way we, we just were able to do it all because we it's not like we both love zombies or we both love this or we both love that, and those are the, the projects we're vying for. It's, we're able to spread the spread the joy <laughs> because we have so many different interests and, and, uh, and, and it works really, really well. And we have a great team at K and B like Carrie Jones, who's our shop supervisor. When Greg and I are on set, he handles everything here. We've got like amazing artists and mold makers and, uh, office staff really, uh, really 
runs the place for us too. So we have a really a great bunch of people. So it's all it all comes down to being teamwork, you know, and and it's about the team. And and I always say it's you know we're as only as strong as our weakest link, and and we really have very few weak links, almost no weak links actually. And and uh, we're all we're all bond, you know bound together to to do the best work we can and provide the the coolest stuff for fans and and film goers and TV viewers and and um, yeah it's it's a tremendous amount of of work and innovation and imagination and teamwork that that bring it all to life in my opinion. Well, well, I know over the years you've turned K and V into one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, makeup and effects companies in the mm-hmm. Hollywood area. So, congrats on that. Hey, thanks. But I will tell you when I look at what you do every day. First of all, it looks incredibly fun to me. I mean, how how could you not look forward to getting out of bed every morning to go be creative like you are? Yeah, it's but fun. I, but I also know that with every kind of business, I don't care what it is, there's a dark side, a not so fun aspect to what you do. Every job's got that. What's yours? Uh, well, I lo- I do love getting up every single morning. Like every morning, I do get up at like five a.m. and uh, I'm excited to get up and come to work and and. Um, I, lo- I don't know. I just love it. It'd be it, you know, when I come to the shop, I lo- you know, if Greg and I aren't on set, we're every day we're at the studio. We're every day at K&B. And we, you know, the shop opens up at 7 and closes at 4. And we're here first up and last out, you know. And, and it's because we care and we love it. And we love being around all the people we work with. And, and then when we're on set, you know, it's another exciting aspect. You know, the hours are much, much longer because... You know, I was on set yesterday for uh, this TV show I'm working on called Legion uh, for FX Network, and my call was like 6 a.m., and I uh, didn't get off till like 6.30 or whatever, so it's kind of a long day, you know, but sometimes it's, it, it's much longer, but I don't know, I just, I love it all, man. I, 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 I just, I'm such a fan of all of it, and I get excited so easily by other people's work. That really fuels me, like when I look at my friend's work, that you know, and even the guys in the sculpting room, like, Got this guy named Dave Grasso and John uh, Wrightson and Andy Burkholz and uh, they're they're amazing and I just get inspired you know everything inspires me and I'm like okay cool cool so even today I'm like I don't have a Halloween costume for tonight you know because tonight's Halloween and so I grabbed this latex skull mask that we had just run and I brought it painted it up and made it all cool and I'm doing up the teeth now and putting in eyes and stuff. I'm like, I'm just going to wear it down the street, walk around, go trick-or-treating. So, um, you know, or hand out candy. That's what my wife and I do. We just go and hand candy out. Um, obviously, I'm, I've reached the point where I'm too big to knock on doors and, and get candy, sadly. But, um, but yeah, no, I just, I, I love it all. I just, it, it stems from just being a giant fan. And, and, um, and I am. That's, that's really what drives me is, is loving. I truly, truly love everything I do. And, and I feel so lucky and blessed uh, that I get to do this every single day. You know, I've written over and over again, whether, whether it's in books or blogs or whatever, that practice makes permanent, not perfect, that we should all be Correct. St- striving towards perfection by making daily incremental improvements in what we do. You've been doing this for a very long time, you know, decades. Mm-hmm. So so how do you push yourself, and, and what do you do to become better at it? I, I, I listen and I learn, and and because I always say I don't know everything, and I don't. And, and I don't always have the answers. And, and I like to troubleshoot with the guys, like be it here in the shop or be it on set. And we'll just kind of round table. And I'm like, okay, I've got this gag or I've got this thing. What do you guys think? How do you think we should go about it? This is what I think. What do you think? And then I'll take, listen to what they have to say. And then we kind of figure out the best way to go. And it can change down the line as we're building it. And like, oh, maybe let's change this. Let's change that. Um, but I think it's, it's uh, you know, no man is an island. So I, I can't make those calls myself. You know, I think that's stupid if I think like, well, nope, this is how we're doing it. That's just that's really like not opening it up to the creative process and 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 uh, developing something beyond what your your own imagination may be. Because I've got a, a you know an amazing cornucopia of brilliant you know mature thirteen year olds that work here and. Um, uh, you know, and and I think that's it. You know, I mean, it's just it's just listening and learning. I love watching. Uh, you know, when I'm on set, I like watching what the guys are doing. They're like, oh wow, that's kind of cool. So you do that, that, and that. Or if I see things I'm like, hey, have you ever done this? And you know, have you ever tried that? I remember a friend of mine, my friend Gino Acevedo, was working on Lord of the Rings, and he he was asking me like, oh, we, we're doing this gelatin stuff, and I'm just having trouble burning it down. You know, burning the edge down. I said, oh, we'll take a little witch hazel and put it in the microwave for like 10 seconds. It'll heat it up and then take it on a little Q-tip and it'll burn the edge off. And he did it and he's like, dude, I never thought about that. That's the greatest technique ever. And, and um, Dick Smith, who was 
you know, the godfather of makeup, had really was an innovator. And what we do now is really stems from what he had figured out, you know, back in the the, the 50s, you know, 40s and 50s, and until his passing uh, a number of years ago. And he had this like really great technique to dissolve foam rubber apply- edges on appliances. And like a, the prosthetics we use are a combination. They could be foam rubber, which is the old school way. And, and we use that all the time. I love it. And, uh, or silicone, but with foam rubber, you would take a little of the spirit gum, which is also used for, it's an adhesive that's used for gluing down hair and stuff like that. And he'd put a little bit of 99% alcohol in it and kind of dilute it. And he'd take a little brush and just blend it on the edges. And somehow it just melted those edges into the skin. And it's a, it's an old Dick Smith trick. Like I have a little bottle that says Dick Smith magic on it, you know? And then whenever I'm doing foam rubber, that's what I use. And it's those sort of things. And, and you pass the information along. I think that's also important. Um, you know, I think my, I think, the generation before me and my generation have always worked as a team and have always passed along the information. I was talking to somebody who's in the next generation uh, the other day, and I said, you know, the thing with you guys is you, you're you so competitive with each other that you're actually missing great opportunity. And it's because they come from the, you know, from the world of face-off, that TV show face-off where it's a competition. Or they come from schools, which it's all about a competition. And instead of by, bounding together and working together to try to problem solve and figure out, they battle each other, you know, and it's like dog eat dog. And I'm like, it's the wrong attitude. You guys are just going to smother each other out and there'll be nobody, you know? And it's like, you have to learn in your community and your generation to work hand in hand, or it's just going to, it's going to just be a a fail. So that's how I see things. Well, my mind, my mind is still back on how you work the word cornucopia into the conversation. I know. I love that word. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, okay. So you talk about creativity and and creativity is a huge part of what you do. Now as as human beings, you know, we have good days, we have bad days. We wake Mm -hmm. up kind of motivated, not motivated. So do you have a certain trick or, or secret that you use to stay creative? I'm, I'm always happy. (laughs) <laughs> well, that I do if know I personally. Get, yeah, yeah. If I if I get bummed out, which I do sometimes, then I, my creativity drops. But I literally feel like part of my job is to be a cheerleader, and um, and I I really I look at things and I'm like, okay, well, you know, if if stuff gets bad, you know, and you, it's just like, okay, well, what am I going to do about it? I'm going to move past it. It could be worse. Tomorrow's a new day. You know, I'm like, it is what it is. What am I going to do? And and that's it. And like, come on, guys, we can do better than this. Do it. Come on, come on, come on. So I really feed myself, you know, like the happy pill all the time, and um, okay, and well. be positive. And 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 I believe in karma. You know, I think that if you are a bummer all the time and you're you know negative, you're just gonna, it's just going to come back to you. But so I try to stay really super positive, and I try to be encouraging and supportive to people, and and um, and I feel that it works. You know, I, I've had a lot of great success with with that with myself and with other people and and uh i just keep it flowing i just i just like um i just like it all so much <laughs> well, well, aside from <laughs> being hyper happy, happy um, it is i'm you, super hyper my yeah. wife's like okay calm down already all right calm down well you also have a reputation for hyper realism in about everything you do and so where do you where do you get that from i mean do you slip some cash to the corner and go watch autopsies and study corpses no where do you not get anymore that? i know that we know that stuff pretty pretty well you know i mean way back when when greg and bob and i started we actually did do that and greg was a, a pre-med student so we had we had we have a lot of books and we know a lot and nowadays it's like i know what this all i could probably put a human being together so um <laughs> well i have to uh, i have to laugh because I, I saw a picture of you on the internet um, uh-huh. where you're standing next to an open trunk full of arms and legs, you know, blood, bloody oh, yeah. arms and legs, and, and the look on your face was priceless in that photo. Kind of, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it, that was fantastic. Okay, another yeah, question yeah. here. So let's shift gears a bit. You love what you okay. do. You're hyper happy uh-huh. all the time. You're hyper awesome at what you do. But if you had to do something other than what you're doing now, what would it be? And I, I, by the way, I think you would be an awesome mortician or taxidermist other than oh, this. God. No, see, I don't like the real dead stuff. See, that's the thing. I, I'm really like, eh. even real blood. I'm like, eh, I don't like real blood. I used to pass out all the time, believe it or not. Uh, up until recent, I'd say the last maybe like uh, five or six years, I, I've been okay. But when I, when I used to, you know, when I had to go get a blood test or whatever, I was out cold. And um, so, yeah, dead stuff. I get we- I get the willies. Uh, I don't like any of that stuff. I would say if I, I, I love photography, I like anything art related. So um, I shoot a lot. I always have a camera on set with me. I've got probably 
I don't know, 100,000 photos of all the past 30 years of on set, some amazing photos that no one's ever, ever seen. Someday I'll put a book out, I'll put a coffee book together of really awesome stuff that I've, I've shot. And some is what I do and some is what other people do and it's a whole bunch of different things. But it's, it's my eye to, you know, the way I see, see the film industry and the world. So I think I'd probably be a photographer because uh, I really, really dig it. Um, I, I have, yeah, I, I no, have to I, laugh. I have to yeah. laugh, man. For a guy, for a guy who makes some of the most scary, uh-huh. bloody, more I mean, oh, yeah. hideous things, the fact that you're, you you hate blood in real life oh, is, yeah, is it. funny. It's it's. Oh so, yeah, no. So, that's by the way, how, how do you guys? Is, don't you have a certain way of making blood so it looks real in yeah. movies? Yeah, yeah. Well, I we, I use a formula that I've used ever since I was a kid, and I got it from Dick Smith, and it's Dick's Dick's blood formula, which is it's really simple, but it's unbelievably effective and and um i used to make all the blood it can be forever and ever and ever and then uh now a guy named chris sarah who works for us has has improved it and you know has different colors and the, the mouth blood tastes has different tastes and we have this and gel blood and zombie blood and quentin tarantino blood and all this uh, all this tons of different bloods um so but i always just started off with dressing blood and, and for me it's really important i'm really kind of crazy about blood as far as you know how it looks on film it has to like not beat up on skin or on clothing. It needs to saturate in and, and look sheathy because blood sheaths. Um, the color has to look right. Um, but, yeah, we mix it all. We have, like, these giant 55-gallon drums, and we mix the blood. Chris mixes it, like, once a month, and we pour it all out because we, you know, into the separate containers. And we're always getting orders from blood, you know, for blood on, on this movie I'm going to go do now. I'm taking probably, like, 20 gallons of blood with me. And, um, you know, Walking Dead takes a lot of blood and everybody. And then we have other, other people ordering blood from us, like different productions. We'll order, you know, 10 gallons here and 10 gallons there. Um, cool. But, yeah, our blood also washes out. It doesn't stain. Um, so that's a big thing. And that's all from Dick Smith, you know, uh, learning. Because I used to correspond with Dick. He lived in New York, and I was in here in California, Los Angeles. And I would write him letters, and he'd send me information. And, and I have a book that's all his original notes you know, copies of his original notes he sent me. And um, in there was the blood formula, and I just started making it when I was, like, probably 13 years old. And I'm like, this is the best stuff in the world. Because prior to that, there was this stuff called 3M blood. And if you watch movies from, like, the 60s and late and early 70s, it's that real, like, red paint-looking blood, you know, like you see, like, in The French Connection or, you know, even The, even, uh, the Godfather. And so it's the 3M blood. And... Um, and then Dick was like, I hate the look of this blood. I'm going to figure it out. And he figured out, uh, you know, a better blood. And he was a true inventor. You know, he taught Rick Baker and, you know, passed along so many, you know, techniques that he developed, you know, the multi-piece prosthetic makeups and how to do this and how to punch hair into this. And none of that stuff had been done before. And Dick, you know, pioneered it. And then we took it and, and kept going and going and going, you know, um, and, and reinventing the wheel, you know, and I saw him six months before he passed away and we went to lunch and he just said, I'm amazed where the industry is today. Like you got out, you guys, meaning our generation have, you know, taken what I designed, developed and have gone beyond my wildest expectations. You know, you guys have surpassed me. And I was going, no, we've never, we're never going to surpass you. The master, you know, that's like saying I'm, I'm better than God. You know, it's like, no, you're the greatest there ever is and ever will be. And, and the rest of us, you know, try to be you. And, uh, it was great. It was great seeing him before he passed because he was so influential in my life and, and everybody else in, in, in my generation and the generation before. So, okay, well, yeah, it's all, it's all about invention. Well, the heck with cornucopia. The new word of the day is sheathy. So, okay, sheath. Yeah. yes, sheath. Yeah. I have sheath. a bunch of words. I like cornucopia. I like, I'll, I'll keep you, I always say, I'll keep you abreast. Uh, I like plethora. Is good. Oh, yeah. So. That's always a classic. <laughs> okay, so you, if you love what you do for work, which you obviously do and are extremely passionate about, it's also easy to let that kind of dominate your life. So, what do you like to do when you're not working? Um, I love being with my wife. My wife, um, Miriam, is um, she's a Norwegian uh, fine artist. And I, I truly do. This sounds crazy. I never thought I'd say this either, but I love being with her. And um, I have a lot of fun. She's so artistic, and she really inspires me. And, and we'll just stay at home sometimes, and we'll just draw or paint or sculpt or, you know, hang out. And, and uh, we cook a lot. We, 
Um, I spend a lot of my <laughs> my money on fine wine, which I collect wine, and we also drink it, and uh, <laughs> and food and, and restaurants. Like I don't go out and buy like, hey, let's go buy a new car, let's go buy a new house. That's all fine. What we have is perfect, you know. And uh, but I just I like to invest in that uh, art. I buy a lot of art. Um, but uh, I think my favorite thing is I just I like being with her. I really really enjoy it, and and um, she's a great partner, you know. And I think that's part of the success of uh, um, you know marriage for starters. But I, I always was like kind of a loner all my life, and I, I love my private time. And I'd say she's probably the only person I know that I don't I don't mind giving up my private time for. You know, like if I go. You know, I just I like being with her all the time. And when I go on location, she comes with me and stays as long as she can or wants to. And and um, and uh, it's great. I love coming home from set instead of coming to home to an empty hotel room, which is, you know, it is what it is. I get to come home to her and we have dinner and we make dinner and we go do things. And it just it just makes life better. You know, having somebody that is is on your side and with you and understands you. And and she tolerates me because I have bunch of crazy crap about me and and uh and uh yeah she's been she's been the perfect person to you know to to, to be with well you, know, you mentioned she was an artist she recently made a short film about you talk about that a <laughs> she did she yeah, she directed her first short movie called uh, waking a monster and i had had this puppet made of of, of me and also uh, i had another puppet made of my friend johnny going away uh, for christmas one year and uh, i don't know why i just was like i think i want to have a puppet made of me <laughs> And a friend of mine, Mike uh, Lisa, who's in um, in New York, um, made it. He's an amazing puppet maker, and um, anyhow, made it. And I, you know, took it out. I'm like, look, Mary, I had this puppet made for me. And she's like, why the hell did you do that? I don't know. Anyhow, time passed, and she's like, I think I want to. I'm going to start interviewing you because I want to start, cap, you know, listen to your story. So every night I'd come home, she'd set up the whole recording little studio in the hotel room because I was on location. I record all these studios. She ended up with like six hours of dialogue. She ended up cutting it down to like 20 minutes. She's like, I'm going to make a short movie, but I want to use the puppet as instead of you. you know, but you puppeteer the puppet, so you puppeteer yourself. So we did that, and we shot it like for six weeks, weekends in a, in a row. She cut it together, taught herself how to edit, do sound, do after effects, do visual effects, do, do everything, you know, and, uh, and cut this movie together. And now it's been on the... The circuit, um, you know, the festival circuit, she's won a bunch of awards for documentary, and and uh, it's a fun little movie. It's going to be in Hollywood, actually, uh, at the Egyptian Theater next weekend at a short film festival, and then I think eventually she's going to put it out there online, and once we're done with the short film festivals, um, that way anybody can access it and take a look at it. But yeah, she's now she's thinking, like, I like this filmmaking thing, so she's got two other projects that you know, she's been working on at home, uh, just doing a lot of illustration and putting together the visual aspect of it first and, and see what she can get out of it. And But yeah, I'm super, super impressed. All I did is puppeteer, tell a bunch of stories, and, and, and shot it, you know, with the DP on it. And, um, well, I, and we, then she, she did everything else. We, we obviously saw it, and it, we, we thought it was awesome. So tell Marianne, you know, congratulations, and it was a wonderful I will. movie. Cool, thanks. Thank okay, you. Hey, yeah, so, hey, she's it's, awesome. It's time for the lightning round. I do this with all, all, my, right. I do, I do this with all my guests. I'm going to give you a couple of words, and you have to pick one that, that most resonates with you. Don't think about it. Just answer the questions quick. Ready? All right. Phone call or text? Text. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. Television shows or movies? Movies. Facebook or Twitter? Neither. Yeah, I was waiting for that one. Toilet paper, over or under? Over. Grilled or pan fried? Grilled. High tech or low tech? Low tech. Nickelback or the Stones? Stones. Call of Duty or Pac Man? <laughs> Pac Man. Sweet or salty? Sweet. And this is always the most important one to me Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars, buddy. Oh, my. What is it with everybody in Star Wars? I love Star Wars. I love Star Trek, but Star Wars changed my life. So. <laughs> That's a whole different discussion for a different day. <laughs> Howard, man. Yeah, I, have, I even have a full Star Vader costume. <laughs> oh, that doesn't surprise me either. I bet, I bet you look awesome in it. I do. I look pretty good. Howard, I want to so. thank you, man, for taking the time you spent with me. So I'm going to end the show by asking you this. Yeah. You've made so many, many characters over the last three decades. Which was your mm -hmm. favorite and why? 
Boy, okay, uh, uh, well, I can answer that. My favorite character, I have to say, is, is the makeup I did on James McAvoy for uh, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, um, which was the Mr. Tumnus makeup. And I, I love that makeup because that was really my first adventure into fan, the world of fantasy. It was the first character I was able to, to create with my and, and that my children were able to see and be involved with. And, um, and I just had a magical experience with that. And for that movie... I had worked, you know, months and months and months prepping the film and finally shot, got to shooting. And James was the first actor we shot. And that makeup was the first actor shot on film and, and um, ended up winning an Oscar for the movie and uh, for best makeup. And, um, and to me, that's my all-time favorite thing I've ever done. Well, thanks again, Howard, for sharing a bit of your life with us today. And thank yeah, all, thank you. And thank all of you for listening and taking a step beyond with us. If you love what you do for a living, you will never work a day in your life, and this principle definitely defines Howard. And although Howard could probably find a way to somehow replicate us, we only get one real shot at life. So we should all be striving to do what we love so we can exhibit the high level of passion necessary to be awesome at it like you, Howard. I hope you continue to listen to A Step Beyond and become inspired to be the very best version of yourself. I'm your host, Anthony Boston. Follow your dreams. Thanks for listening to A Step Beyond. Take a moment, if you would, and leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with those who need to be inspired to become more creative and imaginative in everything they do.